Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the Old Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for dropping by the neighborhood. You picked a great time to stop by, too, because we've got a really cool episode here with Gordon White and Jay Springett. Most of you know Gordon. He's been here before, back in episode 66, and he's the man behind the magic at the Rune Soup blog and podcast. He's also the author of three books, Starships, The Chaos Protocols, and Pieces of Eight. And some of you in the Twitterverse surely know Jay. He's at the JMO out in those parts. Jay will tell us a bit about himself up front in the chat here, so I won't repeat any of that. But this conversation is focused on one of Jay's chief concerns and passions, uh, and one of Gordon's as well, and that is the movement known as Solar Punk. Now, what is solar punk? Well, it's exactly what it sounds like, and we'll explain it in the discourse you're about to hear. One caveat before we get to it, though, Jay and Gordon only had an hour to chat, so no Patreon extension here. Uh, Gordon and Jay were actually hanging out together down on Gordon's farm, which Gordon has just returned to after some crazy wildfires in his area, and I didn't want to monopolize much of their time, so we covered as much as we could in that hour with the hopes of giving some context to this solar punk thing and also laying the foundation for the ideas both in the narrative of this show and, more importantly, in your consciousness. Solar punks Gordon White and Jay Springett are in the house. Right after this. The time has come to unshackle the beast that you have feared for so long. Relinquish your fear and submit to the cause. You will find all you need in these audio recordings. The year is 1990. Welcome to a culture. Gordon underscore white. Welcome back to the show, man. Appreciate the time. All things considered, I hope all is well down on the farm there. Well, it's definitely better this week than it was the last couple of weeks. Absolutely. And is this the first day that you're back down there? No, we got back on Thursday and it's Sunday morning. So everything's still, you know, a bomb site, but at least it's not a burned down bomb site. We still have, you know, the, um, the books are on the floor. All this stuff is just in piles in different rooms. So uh, so that's what I'm looking forward to next week. <laughs> yeah, a lot of work to be done there, I imagine. And at the JMO, Jay Springett, welcome to the show. You're actually on holiday staying with Gordon, so I, it's really cool of you to make some time for this. No worries. So, uh, you know, tell me a little bit about how well, you guys actually know each other. Where did this uh, friendship begin to coagulate? Well, um, Jay started bothering me on the internet, specifically Twitter, when I was still living in London, which is where Jay's based. He's like, we need to meet up. And so uh, so one evening after work, we did. We went for drinks in Fitzrovia, and then it was a lot of drinks, and we got in like a house on fire. And yeah, we've been friends since then. So we're sort of in um, then overlapping circles of, of industry and outside work interest in London. And, uh, and yeah, and, and the rest is history. It's been really nice. <laughs> it's been really nice. Yeah, you guys, uh, it sounds like you had a nice night last night. We don't have to talk about that. But uh, Jay, <laughs> tell, tell the audience a bit about yourself and what it is you do, because you seem to have a nice variety of professional interests and projects that you're working on, some of which we'll get into here shortly. Uh, but do give us that Cliff Notes version of yourself, if you don't mind. 
Sure. So like professionally, I work in technology in the tech sector. Uh, more recently, I've been working in the blockchain space. And outside of, outside of that, I'm a writer, theorist, and strategist for platforms. And I'm really just all about culture, humans, technology, and infrastructure, basically, um, and how those things interact with the environment. And yeah, that's, that's me, basically. Yeah, and tell people a little bit about some of the, the online presence you have. You have a lot of different websites with a lot of different causes that you're sort of working in right now, too. Yeah, so for my sins, one of the things that I'm probably better known for is coining the term stacktivism, which is a term that attempts to give kind of form to a conversation around infrastructure and the relationship we have to it, kind of like the stack of technologies plus the activism part. I'm also involved in a group called Guild, which is a decentralized blockchain group of artists. And I'm also involved in Solarpunk. Yeah, and that is sort of the impetus for the chat here today. You know, Jay, you are one of the curators of solarpunks.net. And I'm going to assume that, you know, some of the audience may not know that term, solarpunk. So tell us a little bit about what that actually means, uh, where it comes from, and what it represents. So solarpunk is a term that... Um, it's a kind of a genre term that has been floating around online for a number of years, but it really didn't get going until 2012, which is when a Brazilian sci-fi anthology called uh, Stories from a Fantastical World was first published in Brazilian Portuguese. And then from there, the, the, the term solar punk is just one of those things that you hear it for the first time and then you're like, oh, I know kind of exactly what that should be or is back in 2012. Um, and that was when a number of other kind of colleagues and collaborators, we founded the Solarpunks Tumblr. And Adam Flynn wrote the Solarpunk Notes Towards a Manifesto for the Hygiograph project. And it's kind of just run from there. Um, certainly not responsible for Solarpunk as a, as a genre, because it's, you know, a vast community of people on the internet, Tumblr kind of building out what is a solar punk genre or a movement? But I've been involved from the very beginning, and it's it's been very encouraging to see the growth of of of, of it as a movement. Yeah, and Gordon, when did you first come across this term? Because you know, I mean, you wrote a blog about it sort of recently, or I guess you wrote a blog about something related to it sort of recently. But when did you first come around to this term and and really sort of try to I don't know make sense of it? Sure. Um, fairly early on, just because Jay and I have been friends for a while, and um, I, I know he mentioned it when we you know, first started hanging out in London, and uh, I was sort of dimly aware of it, but fairly early on, I like, it, I, as Jay says, like as soon as you hear the term, you somehow know exactly what it is. Uh, obviously, it has antecedent inspiration in um, the other various punks, like cyberpunk, and they're not the same, but you kind of get, oh, of course, solar. Uh, and so I'm, I'm interested in it from from being able to, I guess, situate it in, hmm, how to describe this, into like a, a flow of a better way of, of thinking with and, and being with in the world. It is uh, far more utopian. It's far more optimistic. And, and one of the things that I'm quite, I get quite urgent about at you know this point in the timeline is we have that option every damn day to either go um, grim or positive, like regardless of what's going on in the world. And uh, and solar punk is one of those ideas, and it's it's particularly fascinating from a revitalized understanding of the imaginal, because as Jay mentioned, it's not just that they are, it's not just as a movement, you can go, oh, well, these books are solar punk, like you can find them on a hypothetical solar punk shelf. It's actually that the people involved in it are building it out in the world in a sense of well, what are the, what does this genre mean? And what does it mean to define a genre? And what are the component parts of it? And it's a, it's almost like a self-reflexive doing. It's it's a literary genre that exists in the real world as well as in the literary world. And so it's it's a really kind of uh, meta notion. It's it's alive in some way, and and that's uh, very appealing to me. Yeah, I mean, it's not just a, a genre um, of speculative fiction because it really is a movement in art, fashion, activism, and all of those kind of domains where solar punks are kind of seeking to answer the question, what does a sustainable civilization look like and how do we get there? Because I think most people within the, the movement recognize that the future doesn't arrive, you know, doesn't arrive passively fully formed. You know, we have to meet the future on our own terms uh, the way that we always have, which is, you know, through, through culture. Yeah. And how big of a movement is it actually now? I mean, because that, you know, I guess movement has a sort of, 
I think you associate like maybe a certain amount of attention or people involved. Like, has it garnered enough attention and I guess action to label it as a legitimate movement of sorts? I think that's a very fair question. If you consider that the you know cultural movements are a slow burn, they're not you know something that that just pops up. It, they really do have a lot of groundwork that takes place beforehand. And if you consider if it was 2012, 2013, that the, that the term first even started getting discussed on Tumblr, where it kind of has definitely broken out from, here we are in 2019, and there's probably four anthologies of short fiction that have been written um, in the solar punk genre. And in 2019, I'm pretty sure that the first full length novel written by like an established sci-fi author will be coming out on tour. But uh, at the moment, I can't remember who that who that's by. But, you know. As more and more books, it takes a long time to write a novel, you know, so, it, you know, it, these things are, are slowly kind of coming out in the fiction world. But at the same time, uh, there's a decentralized social network and communications technology called Scuttlebutt, which is a fully encrypted social network. Uh, and those guys are building that technology kind of under a, a solar punk banner, as it were, uh, and would consider themselves to be solar punks. Well, some of them would. And there's like Sunbeam City, which is one of the big channels on that on that network. And, you know, they're doing all sorts of things like putting mesh network communication devices that run Scuttlebutt on buoys out to sea. So, you know, you can be fishing and still be connected to an offline social network. Yeah. And I do want to stay on the uh, on the spec fiction part just for a moment. And I, I was just curious sure. if one of you could just parse out because... You know, that is sort of an interest of mine. I just, I love spec fiction, have for, you know, 30 years. But how does it really differ at the core from other spec fiction genres like cyberpunk or steampunk? I mean, obviously those are, well, cyberpunk's more dystopian. Solarpunk is more utopian. Steampunk, I don't know, I don't know how you would describe that, actually, if it's maybe a hybrid of both or like what could have been in the past. I'm not really sure. But what are the major tenets of solar punk that set it apart from these other punk movements in spec fiction? Well, solar punk always faces the criticism of, is it really punk? You know, and that's the question that get uh, that gets asked a lot of the genre. Um, and the, you know, and you can equally just turn it around and say, well, is steampunk really punk? You know, w w what's so punk about cosplaying neo-colonial, <laughs> ne neo-colonial mm. fictions. But I always respond with right now in our particular culture, being optimistic and you know actively fighting for the things that we want to see in the world against the mo the you know the, the the master narrative that we that we all kind of exist inside is punk as hell which is why i think solar punk gets to have its solar punk credentials and then the other side of it yeah i'd absolutely that, second that absolutely second that yep. yeah if you look if you look at what you understand the sex pistols reaction to say the um the climate in britain at the time that they were um, playing and you look at what uh, that wouldn't work for us now if anything there's too much of that and not enough kind of classic move quietly and planting things which is is, is hyper radical it, it that is that is genuinely a thing we can optimistically do it is responding to the conditions like tactically and uh almost imaginally at the same time so it definitely it, it definitely gets to keep punk as far as i'm concerned yeah, and it kind of speaks to that idea of you know, the old cliche, like the revolution will not be televised. So that Sex Pixels type revolution is absolutely up in your face, you know, sort of televised, I guess. And that, that sort of hidden, invisible insurrection, let's call it, is uh, always taking place mm. in movements like this. So Jay, if, go ahead and go back to your thought if you'd like to. I was going to say about how, you know, speculative fiction kind of always is about always about the present as opposed to speculating on the future. It's just a lens to be able to project forward. And when you think about it, cyberpunk really was about the concerns of the 1980s. It was like corporate, uh, totalizing corporate greed, the rise of zero tolerance policing, technology, especially computerization coming down the pike. And what does that particularly look like? So all of those concerns are, you know, things that are inherent within the cyberpunk genre. And for solarpunk, you know, it's it's the questions around we're about to we're essentially going through what will be the greatest energy transition um, since the discovery of, of of coal for steam engines. And this as a new technology, what does that particularly mean for the future? Um, and Adam Flynn says says has the line in his manifesto that um, infrastructure is a site of resistance. 
and you know what kind of futures can be built with decentralized solar solar energy or you know all of the other various things that we can we can be using cool cupboards <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's um, what I what I appreciate because obviously it, uh, solar punk flies together or hangs together with a lot of other, you know, interests of mine, permaculture, and so on. But the the optimism component means that we can talk about. I, I have problems with words like energy descent futures because I think that is insufficiently optimistic. Uh, and you can talk about even though you kind of use these words, if you what was what's so exciting about the solar part of of punk, and you think about spec friction and when we were doing early sci-fi, it was it was about the arrival of steam and trains and telegraphs, and we're at another point like that, and we have the opportunity to go. I don't think it's any. I actually want to live like that. I want cool cupboards. I don't want, you know, wires connecting to centralized generators of 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 hydrocarbon energy. And so it's not living with less. It's being excited about the the opportunities of a, of a new way of living because of, as Jay said, the technological transition that we are going to go through one way or the other. Yeah, and. I think, I mean, do you guys think that, I mean, we're talking about it as spec fiction, but could we take the speculative label off of it now? Like, is this an actual thing that's happening in reality? Well, see, so I'd take the fiction word of spec. Ah, yes, okay, yeah, okay exactly. perfect, okay. Andrew Dan Hudson has a line in his uh, essay that he wrote a couple of years ago, which is called On the Political Dimensions of Solarpunk. And he, he has a line in it where he says, Solarpunk's strategy is to create pockets of progress and imagination within a larger political landscape. So, you know, it's it's like cosplaying solar punk is not like cosplaying steampunk. You can just be a solar punk and read the fiction and get excited about, you know, all of the various technologies and permaculture and keyline design and stuff like that. Yeah, cosplaying solar punk is sort of rewilding your suburban front yard or or starting to grow things in it. Like it's when does that we have this it's the same thing with fiction, which is why I would drop that word off. I, I think we have these inherited categories we in the west think of performance as fake because we've sort of split it as like well you're not being a real person you're being that and that's not found anywhere else there's how can you cosplay if if part of the just ontological experience of solar punk is in the doing and in the doing is sitting there thinking and and imaginally getting excited in that in what these futures might look like would you guys describe this then as an inherently political movement i th- think that solar punk as a strategy is a political strategy or you know in in some way has uh has politic you know has political action within that sphere but when you actually get through to what solar punk is all about and what people are writing solar punk all about it's a space that emphasizes individual autonomy consent universe uh, unity and diversity egalitarian distributions of power a lot of other writers and people who are interested in are about creating spaces for indigenous sovereignties, reproductive justice, queer politics, so on and so forth. And the the kind of environment of the kind of spec futures that solar punk has been creating means that you can't speak for other solar punks. I'm only speaking for myself on this particular, you know, on this show. But there's a principle of polyphony. You know, you can be in dialogue and be an occasional chorus with people but you know there will always be particular points where people will disagree and i think that's quite recognized within the genre gordon do you have a thought on that well yeah just in general like is art political like what what art hasn't responded to human power structures i i could argue the case that the lascaux cave paintings are in some way in dialogue with paleolithic social structures so Yes. Is it political? What, what isn't? Um, or And is the problem there again with us using a P word for something? It's almost like it's a subset of it rather than the other way around. So I, I'm, I'm either all yeah. art is political or no art is political. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that is fair. That is fair. So where do we have to look at then to like, where can these conversations and this discourse grow? Because it seems like the institutions that we would typically rely on for these have been, I don't want to say infiltrated, I don't want to use those kind of words, but I'm, I'm kind of struggling here to, to describe it. But it seems like the normal institutions where we would have these discourses are being dominated maybe by, you know, neoliberal political groups or, you know, whoever. So how do we take back the places, the institutions that we need to have these conversations in? I don't think we take them back. I think you, you know, you have a sort of fight club 
vision of letting you know vines grow up over these institutions and and create something else, create something analog. I don't think you um, need to. I know I, infiltration or just everything is shit. You know, one or the other. And I think one of the impetuses or the impetus that gives rise to things like solar punk right now is in the medium term, in that kind of like dominant of witchcraft emergence, it's one of dozens of things that happen because something new is now growing rather than, oh, well, we need to take this back and, and operate it like it like it used to be because like this is how we got here. This is <laughs> the situation we're in is because of the, the sheer existence of of these structures or institutions. So I don't actually think it needs to take anything back. I think it needs to quietly, which is a very solar punk thing find those analog connections of people and place and and optimism and 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 we don't know where they are yet that's emergent and and connect and and see what happens and have it grow yeah i always kind of think about that um it being both a movement and kind of speculative fiction um i've previously called it a grand dress rehearsal for the kind of future that we actually want to live in by writing all of the fiction and then stepping into it but honestly we can build a solar punk society kind of in the places and in the moments between people that the state neglects because, you know, that's exactly how any kind of deeply radical thing ever, ever gets done. Yeah. And I want to go back to that, you know, the idea of cyberpunk real quick, because I mean, we are, it seems like we're living in a, a cyberpunk esque world, you know, like a lot of the tropes are, are very real. It seems like we've just sort of uh, accepted that this is our future, you know, like as a as a society and a, a lot of people in this genre of podcasting, for example, you know, talk about works from Philip K. Dick or William Gibson, works like The Matrix. And I, I think that those things have set an expectation in our minds that this is where we're headed and we have no choice in that matter. And what's funny about that to me is that all these these characters, for example, in these stories are fighting against the system they find themselves in, the cyberpunk world of, Jay, you said it earlier, like unchecked corporate power and unchecked police power. But no one in these stories ever seems to propose a solution to improve the world they're living in. And obviously, I think that sort of bleeds over into our shared reality here. And Gordon, I'd like to ask you something about that. Is embedding these sorts of stories into the public consciousness... I mean, obviously, that's that's a form of magic that has probably helped create this environment where, you know, our reality has been sort of passively accepted by the majority. Is this just hyper sigil after hyper sigil, you know, being cast into the public consciousness and it's working because no one realizes what's even happening and we keep interacting with it, pouring money into the ideas, you know, both from a production standpoint and a consumption standpoint? Um, it's not just that, but it is at least that. So I have and I've, I've been big on this for a few years which is, uh, I, you know, that Jungian idea that ideas have people, um, people don't have ideas. So yeah, we there is some human agency in doing this to kind of operate in the world because uh, in a way that is better because your your mind, again, problematic term, or, or your experience of the imaginal in is in some way entangled with how futures work. So cyberpunk, either it happened, or, and here's a more optimistic opportunity, or people like Philip K. Dick saw the future and wrote it in the present. How exciting, if that's it, that we have a much more, um, there's sort of nowhere to go but be utopian. Because either your mind creates it, or you can be a vector for these things coming true. And you have the, the option of being dystopian or utopian. It's almost a responsibility to be utopian in that sense. So yeah, there's, it's, there's certainly a... Um, semi-conscious human hypersigil agency involved but also these ideas show up at, at this point in the timeline yeah so i guess conversely then solar punk would be just as effective then uh, at creating these intended realities if more people were exposed to the ideas in fiction and art for example right i, I can't so. see how it would hurt yeah i, th I don't I, I don't think it would be like nope this is a mistake yeah Let, <laughs> let's go back to dystopia I can't see how it would hurt, but also it's it's got its own agency. It, I was thinking about this as Jay was describing the history from, well, it started 2012, 2013. There's some short fiction anthologies. There's maybe a book coming out. And it's having just gone through a fire when he described it as a slow burn. The last three weeks of this bushfire around here is sometimes a slow burn, sometimes a fast burn, depending on the weather. It will jump 20 kilometers in a day or go back on itself or hide in a tree line. And it moves with its own agency. And so solar punk is a slow burn until it isn't and then it might be a slow burn again and and once we can kind of recognize the agency in ideas operating in you know 
the world rather than just humans, something like this can only move at um, analog or organic speeds, I think. So, you know, the cyberpunk worlds then, they're immersed in technology, and obviously it's not working in favor of the population there. And Jay, I'm curious if you could tell us, you know, what's the solar punk stance on new technologies? I mean, like, obviously, we've already had so much developed to this point. But I guess, how does the solar punk movement interact with what's already here? But then how do they account for what's going to be here later as well? I, th- I mean, solar punk as a genre is, you know, is very comfortable with new technologies, especially kind of one of its major things that it hangs on is, is about the energy transition that we're about to go through. But also, like from the solar punk worlds and futures that we can imagine, you know, it's 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 using things like weeds for bioremediation as a technology. Even though I don't particularly like that word for its use, but sort of what other what other technologies can we imagine, you know, like and build into the city, for example, strengthening people's immune systems by you know wildflowers and stuff being around the city, so on and so forth. If you're talking about things like GMOs, then that's an ongoing debate within the particular solar punk community about whether it, like GMO technology is a thing that solar punk is, you know, super, super pro or against. And it's a debate that's obviously part of wider society. I particularly think that stuff like that should be off planet because, you know, that's the sci-fi world that we live in. Yeah, I'd say the problem with that is is technology and having that. If we don't define that for ourselves, that word, um, then we inherit one that I that, that kind of encodes that human nature divide, which is artificial. Like, well, what is is the um, the the old timey cyberpunk versions of internet? Is if that's technology, and as Jay said, what about um, a wildflower assembly? Is that technology? And all of a sudden, you realize it's not necessarily the correct word. And this is what I've been. Yeah. This is where solar punk is sort of hangs together with the discussions I have within permaculture for, for people who are kind of reconfiguring, because we've inherited all these terms from a system that sees the world incorrectly, like provably. So is it a nature technology dialogue? I don't think so. It's how we, it's something else. It's, it's um, right. Even that's not correct. It's living in flow and living in flow requires appropriate levels of organic and inorganic complexity. I know that sounds wordy, but if you think about that, it's it's sort of a step one into going, oh, okay, I, I have in fact inherited these categories which are not useful in the medium term. So for my issue there would be the same thing. It swings on the word technology rather than um, organic and inorganic, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the solar punk content that i've kind of read uh, or seen um has quite nuanced views on like those particular arrangements it doesn't rely on wild technological advancements you know i think even the very name solar punk implies that a scientific breakthrough in technology inverted commas you know aren't isn't going to fix the environment social or any of our economic problems yeah abs- it's it's a clever immediate um double meaning because it first of all it goes to cyberpunk when you hear solar punk you go oh it's cyberpunk so this is a future based on solar technologies and you go yeah that's it on one level but the next level down is everything in our solar system literally runs on the sun okay. so it's yeah. not technology it's um and that's to jay's point like solar punk doesn't require a future where everyone has solar panels on the roofs of their suburban houses the wildflowers is a solar assembly right because it runs on the sun yeah, I saw a uh, I saw a photo actually on something you shared Jay on your Tumblr I think and it was a photo of a of a robot horse with solar collecting skin towing an old school plow with a farmer behind it. And I thought like, damn, <laughs> that is a that is a great sort of photographic encapsulation of what this movement is. It is blending technology, you know, like sort of I guess what you would call futuristic technology with sort of this old school approach to farming and permaculture and so on. It's a really interesting movement when you get into it. <laughs> I think even just from from a world building standpoint, even if you just take cyberpunk as like the condition, what does the countryside look like? And where are all the radical people in a cyberpunk countryside, you know? Yeah, but um, you never see and, that countryside. It's almost like they don't exist, you know? It's it's, it's it just seems like it's decaying yeah. urban landscape and that there's there's no rural way of life anymore. But the, I mean, but the 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 build out and the regeneration of, say, cities like New York in the seventies, you know, like that regeneration of cities and and 
was that particular time period was also when people started really migrating to cities now we you know 50 percent of people in the entire on the earth like live in cities that's another concern of cyberpunk kind of that urbanization of the world so you can kind of see why that is a focus of the genre and you know in 2019 our focus is on you know or should be on regreening the world so like that's why solar punk can be set both in the countryside and the city yeah, and you mentioned, I think one of you mentioned economics in one of your answers there a few minutes ago. So if the solar punk ethos, you know, becomes a popular way of life, I suppose, is that the end of capitalism, Western capitalism, as we know it? Well, it's a reconfiguration of, it's the question of what's next. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it would be certainly the kind of um, 70s neoliberal debt-based one, for sure. But it's more about how many or it's it's not what one thing comes next. You get like um a blossoming of of different modes of interactive or, or economic interaction, I suppose is one way of putting it. So um Jay's a crypto nerd, so that would be an example of it. But it's also it's imagining a future where you have non monetary barter or exchange with um your neighbors like we always had. Uh, and it would be a combination of those two having some sort of decentralized digital currency that works on a multi-planetary basis and also swapping eggs for jam with your neighbor. Yeah, that's kind of what I was trying to get to, you know, and since Jay, you know, you said you work in, in blockchain, and I was just curious how the solar punk movement deals with money or currency in this utopian future, you know, is, is crypto sort of the default or the standard? Is there a standard international currency? Is there a UBI, for example? Just curious your thoughts on that. Um, I think if you, if you take a, if you read through all of the different fictions, all of the above has been written about, you know, how does it work? Um, you know, some some fictions have uh, money is completely ended as, you know, part of the representation of the commodity form. For my own kind of work, because obviously solar punk is just not spec fiction, I'm involved in deep sensing, trying to make forests have personhood under law, so then we can have AIs running on top of that. Uh, who can sit on the board and make decisions about the landscape, so on and so forth. So, you know, like this kind of hyper-networked, a hyper-networked landscape uh, is certainly something that can produce its own value. And when I mean value, I don't mean, you know, kind of money. It's like if you plant a tree where there wasn't a tree before, then you've already created more value both physically, but also you can represent with sensor data and, you know, carbon sequestration and so on and so forth. This seems like a, a reaction then to what people perceive as impending ecological and environmental catastrophes. Is that fair to say? And obviously, you know, climate change at large is that. It's part of that. But also some things I've seen some others point out in some resources you've shared, Jay, like fossil fuels decreasing, you know, poisoned water supplies, antibiotic resistance, uh, pandemics, overpopulation, and so on. So my question related to this is, and this, I don't want to get too conspiratorial here, guys, but how much of this, of these problems in your estimation are maybe manufactured for political or corporate gain or, or for profit? And I only ask this because, one, I've seen, you know, covert geoengineering programs and so on, especially here in the States. You know, they're now openly talking about, for example, blocking out the sun by spraying aerosols in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys saw that story uh, on CNN a few weeks back, but I, it seemed like it was the first mainstream sort of acknowledgement that these programs are happening. They didn't really phrase it that way, but, you know, I think you can read between the lines. And then there's the other component that I call scarcity marketing, you know, where you make it seem like something like water, for example, is running out or will run out, which means you have to conserve your usage of it while companies, you know, like Nestle can just pull whatever they want out of the ground and sell it back to you without much regulation. So my question is, how much of these threats that solar punk seems to be responding to are legitimate and i guess how much of it is solar punk really attempting to counteract or overcome well i'll, I'll start because you use the c word so i guess this one <laughs> begins with me um all of it, it, it like every single component of it is a conspiracy in some way shape or form the nestle one's a good example or paying off local senators so that you can dump toxic waste from your factory into the river is by definition of a conspiracy. Now, the ones you're talking about that include the use of geoengineering and so on, every single 
area of threat you just identified is both true and either deliberately weaponized or message shaped for particular benefit, right? So on that level, yes, I just think I'd push back on whether or not Solarpunk is reacting to or rather emerging from. Because if it's emerging from, it doesn't need to, there's no such thing as winning. You're not in a Hegelian dialectic where you're going backwards and forwards with um, a sort of demonic monopoly man of 20th century industrialism, right? It's um, it's emerging from, and it's emerging from, and here's where its optimism is, because if you try to put it in battle with the existing power structures, it will lose. Something Bill Mollison said is, although the challenges of the world appear insurmountable, the solutions are almost embarrassingly easy. And that is a solar punk or per permaculture attitude, which is look at all this stuff, some of which is false, like a, a lot of the you know what I mean by that? I don't say this isn't climate change denying, but a lot of that Jill Stein, who I love, thinks the world is going to be, the, the sea levels are going to be 10 meters higher by 2050. And that's not correct. There's, so there's a lot of deliberate fear mongering and, and message stuff going on. And nevertheless, the solutions are the same. It doesn't matter how much of it is a conspiracy or um, an accurate depiction of the medium term future. As Bill Mollison says, the solutions are embarrassingly simple. Let's do them. I think that the biggest conspiracy you know as a reaction to but i mean the biggest conspiracy is if you look out the window is it eden if it's not then there's work to do you know like if it's not eden out the window then you know we could be living somewhere better so we've we've got a lot of work to yeah. do and that's what we should be doing that's true the biggest conspiracy is the one that tricks you into thinking you have no power or agency in in your experience of life and that's um, that's a really dangerous one. Again, this is why this is why I am so interested in a utopian turn, not just in a solar punk sense, but in an everything sense, because that option is always available to you. And as Jay says, look out the window. If it isn't Eden yet, let's uh, let's do something. Well, let's inject this term hope punk into the conversation now. What does this term mean exactly? Like, where did that come from, and how does it differ from solar punk? I actually uh, can't speak with much authority on this particular term, but it is a term that has also been circling around Tumblr. You know, so if solar punk is kind of the breakout term from 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 Tumblr, then there's also like lunar punk and hope punk. And as hope punk was described in that recent article that came out just before Christmas, it was very different from how I understood it um, at the time. But I guess this is actually what hope punk is. Um, Hope punk seems to be that instead of being utopian and, and moving forward and moving, you know, moving quietly and planting things, uh, as solar punk would say, hope punk is about not being depressed about the world and expending energy into being hopeful, which uh, I'll pass this over to Gordon, which he wrote about in his recent piece on his blog. But to me, that doesn't seem like a particularly useful kind of like mental position to be in. No, you're, you're externalizing your own agency. Hope punk to me just seems like some sort of centrist, well, um, you know, maybe things will get better, which is fine. But if you are hoping for something rather than the doing, then you are not, you know, you're not in a position or a flow of agency. You're kind of waiting. And it, it just frustrated me because it just, oh, great. So now there's a... Um, you know, now there's a literary movement that's basically just Twitter. Like, oh, uh, we'll sit here, we'll sit there knowing this is all really bad, but like maybe it'll be good someday. Just, you know, yeah. If it's not eaten out the window, don't hope for it. <laughs> so it's not like it's bad. It's not in a sense that people need to stay away from that. It's certainly a better attitude than the kind of grim, everything's fucked dystopianism for sure. But it's the same amount of energy, mental energy, like an imaginal experience to be hopeful and not necessarily do anything as it is to be utopian. Literally the same amount of energy. So why not Why not just be utopian? Yeah. And I think that, Jay, if you're talking about that Vox article uh, that came out. Yeah, I think yeah even, that was the one. Yeah. yeah, I think they even grouped The Handmaid's Tale into these, these stories of hope punk or that you could slap a label on. And I was kind of like, what the fuck? Like, that doesn't really seem to fit. But <laughs> Well, that is, yeah, that's where I had to write that article on it, too, because I'm like, yeah, Handmaid's Tale, what, great series. But like, if that's hope punk, if it's like we're in a totalitarian thing and maybe just this one little thing, like we're essentially literally waiting for a hero. and 
Jung, Campbell, all the rest of it will tell you that that hero is never external. And so be utopian, don't be hopeful. I just want to jump in around that particular thing. And it's I, I think it's absolutely shocking that, you know, some of the biggest parts of mainstream culture coming out of the US right now is essentially the superhero genre, which, first of all, is a genre designed for children, <laughs> that's, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. got mega mega marketing and you know mega money behind it but also it it just seems to be i mean i haven't watched any of the marvel movies at all but it's just each movie seems to be one savior after another banding together to face ever increasing existential crises and then there's the newest movie that just came out that's like you know got like 30 people in it and they're all fighting a bigger existential crisis and it's it's like that it's just a, such a bad symptom of of where kind of like the the larger culture is in in terms of media yeah in terms of its power too i've watched a few of them they all blend together for me but um it's not just this sort of externalizing of heroism fighting ever increasing odds it's a hyper militarizing of it too the last few of them that you watch have a, a us military industrial heroes and and like being on that kind of things you go this is not these aren't the tools, these aren't the imaginal tools that um, bring about utopia. Um, they're, they're a symptom, which is the right way of, like, at least we get a vision of where we are in the world, and they need not necessarily be as they're currently expressed. I mean, there's a whole bunch of work on, on um, different superheroes, and the external, externalized ones are of less imaginal value than the kind of internalized, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, I just want to echo what you said, that's all. I well, just realized okay. I'm probably going to get loads of hate for calling all of those oh, movies, show, like, children's yeah. movies, but, you know, like, <laughs> you know, it's a hill I'll die on. <laughs> no, I mean, dude, I, I grew up reading comic books, so they are mm -hmm. completely marketed towards kids for the most part. Like me too, and, you know? Yeah, yeah. And adults who refuse to grow up. So that's totally cool, <laughs> you know, but... But like Gordon said, you know, it, it does sort of take the agency out of you as an individual. And those movies, uh, for example, too, they make it seem like you have to have some sort of superhuman ability to be able to overcome the threats in your world, I guess. And that's just not true, you know, like, well, blatantly no, false. it's not only not true, but it's also, it's only half of the not true because you do have, like, everyone is magic. Like, you actually do have them. <laughs> so it's this double hit. It's this double hit of being like, well, I can't do anything because I'm not a superhero, but like plot twist yes you are because everyone is so it, it's i think about the um the endless and i get it it's money making especially as comics as an industry and so they're essentially using that part of their platform or ip to test ideas that then get turned into you know dozens of movies a year by the looks of it but i think about what chris Knowles said in his description of synchro mysticism as performing depth psychology on culture so even if you do like, and I, you know, like whatever you like, you know, if you like superhero films, fine. But that doesn't get you off the hook for performing that depth psychology on it. What is this actually saying about culture? And it's, um, it, it means that it hasn't got a, a good position with regards to personal agency. It hasn't got a good position with regards to, I guess, the full range of villainy uh, of, and, and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a really useful thing to just emergently observe in that synchromistic or depth psychological sense. Yeah, and before we get towards the end here, Jay, I wanted you to touch on an idea that you actually you uploaded a talk to your YouTube channel about this topic, and you had you had a section in there called strategic narrative, and in that section you got into this idea of land as platform. And I was just curious if you could explain what that phrase means, land as platform. Okay, I'll keep this brief, as eventually this will be a book. But one of the things I think that people tend to misunderstand about platforms when we think about them is that things like Facebook and Twitter ultimately are popularly considered as multi-sided markets, either of information or money or you know various things that are moving forwards. But that's not exactly what platforms are designed to do. Platforms are, are social technological systems of both you know combined of humans and processes and technologies that are designed to create more value than the platform itself. So for, you know, like the PC is a platform, the PC as a, as a technology is a platform because it creates so much more value for everybody else. And when you get platforms right, essentially they're designed to flower and, and that is to, to recompose and compost previous iterations of itself to create new and, and, you know, 
better value for other people. So given that, that's exactly how the environment works. So like land as platform is how do we start thinking about the future and the land around us as a platform to create flourishing, not just for humans, but for all of biodiversity. And, you know, it's things like key line design, uh, but also things like I'm interested in is sensor data and, you know, AIs and, and so on and so forth. But I, I think it's just a nice term to be able to, to, to begin to draw down kind of this notion of platform to the land around us. And I'm traveling at the moment and I've just was in Bali and you walk through some of the valleys that are completely rice paddied across, you know, all of the, the place has basically been terraformed and it feels like land is a platform because it's like a spaceship or a land ship, you know, like people are inside this environment and the entire environment has been edited by humans in a way to move them forward through time around them without damaging or harming the wider environment. So kind of like that's, that would also be a key example of like land as platform is, is like rice paddies. Yeah, it's uh, the PC example is is really, really good because one of the things, particularly if you're in a in any sort of I hate this term, but quote unquote eco space, if it's if it's permaculture or, or whatever it is, you know, you happen to be doing. One of the things I've had a real bee in my bonnet about for years is viewing human place interaction as loss only. And that's not correct. And 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 it's just it just isn't. Like biologically, that's not a correct thing. We are certainly damaging in many ways that we interact but it's not a loss only relationship and to think about it as land as platform almost trips you up in a good way before you start thinking that you can in fact have flourishing of food and biodiversity and just possibilities economic possibilities lifeway possibilities from land rather than oh goodness we've messed this we should somehow clean it up or or, or box it off and and call it nature and and not touch it and turn the whole world into a zoo Landers platform is an opening up of possibilities, biodiverse ones, uh, agricultural ones, economic ones, creative ones, uh, emotional ones, and, and so on. It's really, really, um, it's a really clever initial pivot to get people's heads right in in a uh, in a more optimistic game. I think. Yeah, and you know, Gordon, you are obviously big into the idea of permaculture, and not just into it, but actually you know, practicing it. And uh, I guess you're practicing the the art of it too, on some level. And you're actually, uh, you're currently living, I would call it the uh, permaculturalist wet dream, you know, on your farm there. And <laughs> I think this obviously seems to play well with the solar punk movement. So does permaculture, uh, and Jay, feel free to jump in here too, but does that or can it fulfill, you know, in real life, the hopes and dreams of this solar punk movement on social media? Is that part of the answer is it the answer to unlocking the future this movement is seeking definitely not um for the utopia i want both of these notions become compost i don't Mm. like for the utopia i want one doesn't become the other there's a lot of stuff and i'm doing some work with this i'll be contributing to a number of books this year around changing permaculture has its own um, utopian improvement process or work that it needs to do as a discipline or a collection of ideas or a movement, which myself and friends like Dan Palmer are looking at, it has the same challenge of, of porting um, inaccurate descriptions of the world and, and insufficiently optimistic views of what are possible and things about its lack of design theory, although it purports to be a design science. So it has some internal work to do as well. It is not an off the shelf like, well, solar punk is... Um, everyone does permaculture, and that's not correct. Mm. I was just going to say that that solar punk, particularly like what we, we've been doing on the solar punks Tumblr, is you don't need to imagine new futures to create a solar punk world. It's it's very much more about looking sideways at what already exists and projects forward. So, obviously, we post things about permaculture on the blog, but you know, there's so many other technologies like vertical seaweed farming which is solar punk as hell. You know, there's there's all sorts of things that are happening and you just need to look sideways and embrace them and project forward as opposed to saying, this is this, or, you know, I, I previously have said that solar punk is the propaganda wing of the permaculture movement, but, you know, that might not necessarily be, be true, but it's a fun thing to say. Um, it is fun. And it also, yeah. it is at least that. It's just, it's also lots of other things. I mean, where this yep. is why we're... Why I've spent so long and I've been banging that kind of dominant of witchcraft drum for a, a little while now is these things are all 
emergent from an underlying um, imaginal change. So we have about a regenerative ag, um, permaculture, urban farming, um, solar punk, all of these things aren't sequential. They're all kind of wildflower eruptions from, you know, an imaginal land as platform. And, and I, I see them in that sense. Maybe if you dig down into this imaginal land, that it is in fact this, the one sort of mycelial network, or maybe or rhizomatic network, or maybe it isn't. But it, it, it just seems to me as a, a beneficial eruption and our responsibility. And you can like dystopian fiction all you want. Some of it's great. But like our, yeah. our responsibility is to become aware that these, all these things are an eruption of some underlying pivot, right? Or some underlying change or emergence. And we have the opportunity and responsibility to participate in that. And honestly, it is just by thinking with it. You can you can certainly go out and um, do your permi thing and, and grow whatever food you can. And I would recommend that anyway. But you don't even need to do that. You just need to think with these ideas and you're, and you're part of that process. Like I said earlier about like the, it's just the notion of polyphony. Like all of those things are are ongoing and unfolding in the world, and they are you know in chorus and occasional dialogue with each other. And you know, taken as a whole, it's a it's a beautiful chorus. But you can you can stick to one line if you want. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Gordon, I want to go back to you for a moment too because you've mentioned the dominant of witchcraft a couple times, and I guess you may have already answered this, but I'm going to ask it anyways. But I was curious what you thought of, you know, solar punk from a, a more Western esoteric point of view. You know, does this movement sort of complement this dominant of witchcraft movement that you've harped on for a couple of years now? Or does that complement solar punk? You know, I guess one way or the other. Is this is this all part of your, you know, I guess you call it re-enchanting the world? Is that all syncing up here now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, it is, uh, and I, again, bearing in mind, I use this as a, as a frame. So Charles Fort's um, progression of dominance and the one that we're probably in um, after the dominant of science is the dominant of wider inclusion or witchcraft as Dr. Jack Hunter and whatever calls it, which I love, obviously. So yes, I think, and this is a decision I use to frame and have my ideas interact. Uh, I would situate solar punk within it rather than the other way around. As for its relationship i don't i wouldn't consider myself a western esotericist but i know what you mean like from a like practical magic in the english-speaking world sense Mm -hmm. it has that possibility without question particularly the stuff that i think will emerge into so the thing that emerges into solar punk and some of the work i'm doing with these permies at the moment is how we incorporate psi data uh like we know we've known for 120 years that Human thoughts, again, problematic term, improve the growth rates of, um, you know, plants, particularly edible ones on a farm or, or what have you. Like we can intend to make organisms that we are in relationship with work better. Like, and and that if that's true, and it is, then that has implications for what is the optimal combination of quote unquote technology or complexity and our local environment. In the medium term, and that's kind of solar punks there, right? So I would say an immediate overlap is envisioning solar punk futures where people are not only aware or allowed to be aware that psi is real, but that we have kind of techniques baked into a quote unquote permaculture process that uh, that maximizes their capacities. Because if it works and it does, it's actually your responsibility as a human in your local environment to do that. You may, that may be your ecosystem function if you have the option with your Again, problem with the word mind. But if you have your uh, like uh, the capacity as an organism to make things grow better, that might be your ecosystem function, and you might do it. So yeah, there's a, definitely an overlap. There's just as Jay said, there's not because it's so new. You know, maybe if we have this call in 50 years' time, and there is hundreds of, of uh, solar punk texts, then I'm sure many of them will be filled with this kind of exciting blend of interactivity and psi and magic and so on there is a solar punk witchcraft manifesto floating around but i can't remember where it is right now but yeah there is there's quite a few things in that space that that definitely kind of lines that tie into to solar punk as a genre yeah that does sound interesting uh if you have that please send it to me i'd love to take a look at it i have not seen that so i know that this is a, an optimistic future a utopian future but and that doesn't mean it's not without some potential threats to it, obviously. And, you know, it's threats that you have to take seriously. So I'm wondering how you guys in this environment account for or handle, you know, politics that may hinder this vision or threats like eco-terrorism, perhaps. You know, because 
for example, there are places here in the States where you can't disconnect from the grid. You can't collect rainwater. You can't grow your own food because it's against the law. So, I mean, on some level, solar punk is definitely punk here in that sort of 1970s sense of the word, you know, because it's quite mm -hmm. rebellious in an era where environmental protections are, you know, loosely in place, not to protect the environment, but, you know, to protect a corporation's ability to profit from it. So how do you go Absolutely. about... Absolutely. Yeah, so how do you go about implementing this idea if there's a system in place that's trying to prevent such ideas from actually becoming realities? Guerrilla gardening is the model. Exactly. Mm -hmm. you, you, you plant stuff illegally and get away with it. Which I guess we've been doing for hundreds of years, right? So we might as well keep yeah, doing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ever since we made the idiotic decision of making a plant like legal or illegal, which is mental. But... Um, Yes, uh, you do that. You also do the simultaneous thing of uh, horizontal sharing of how idiotic this is. And people have done this on a sort of local council basis in, in places in the US and Australia. When you get these ludicrous laws that are designed, like the, my favorite one, and this is the US one, it's like, oh, you can't plant your own or grow your own food because that's, uh, that could be hazardous to your health, like you might make yourself sick. So please do go and buy this low nutrition food from our terrible nearby supermarket, which is industrially made and GMO. And you, if you can horizontalize and, and make visible to your neighbors that op, that fucking scam, then you are kind of step one on a local council basis to, to start to change this stuff around because local councils are terrified of angry neighbor mobs because they rely on them for their jobs. And so there are always horizontal ways of, of changing some of these idiotic laws, and they would begin council up to state in, in a U.S. system, right? Uh, you do it there, and it's fine. But in the meantime, you know, move quietly and plant things, as, as Jay said, you gorilla garden. Work out what your edible weeds are and um, grow things that we know are food that um, fall outside the law because they've not only made the moronic decision of criminalizing actual other organisms, um, but they've also criminalized the wrong ones. So, like, you can actually eat edible weeds um, if you're not allowed to grow spinach. <laughs> so uh, let's wrap up then, guys, with some recommendations for books or films or TV shows or any other sort of you know artistic property that people could interact with in order to better understand solar punk or permaculture even and its aesthetic and its goals. And these can be older, uh, newer, whatever. There's no time limit associated with this. So just give me some of your you know, I guess maybe introductory text that people could sort of pick up somewhere and really get into the mode of thinking through this stuff. People should be interested in reading through the short fictions, pick up the groups of anthologies. The uh, Brazilian anthology was kickstarted. Uh, the translation was kickstarted and came out last year uh, in English with uh, World Weavers Press. They've also got a, um, they have an anthology that they released alongside that, which is called Glass and Gardens. There's also an anthology of dragons, which is a solar punk anthology, and each story features a dragon, which is awesome. And there's a couple of other, you know, anthologies and short stories. Um, I highly recommend reading the short story Sunshine State, which is in the Everything Change PDF, which is about climate futures. And I think that might have been ASU, but you can find that that story online. And, you know, Kim Stanley Robinson's 2140 is, is a really good solar punk book. And also, I would recommend David Holgrim's Retro Suburbia, because... That was going to be uh, my one. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I would second that. That's absolutely the best. And it's expensive, and he's been on my show, so you can listen and we, if you, um, you want to kind of decide to buy it or not. But it's the best example of, of a, how you could optimistically reconfigure suburban life right now, where there's, you know, without having to speculatively confabulate, in the words of Donna Haraway. And that would be the other one I would recommend, um, Staying with the Trouble by um, Dr. Donna Haraway. And yeah, you know me, Ryan, I'm, I'm going to recommend some Ursula. I'm going to recommend Always Coming Home or something, which is pre-Solar Punk, obviously. But Solar Punk, mm -hmm. funny enough, Jay, we Jay and I were talking about this last night, has deep DNA in that kind of 60s utopianism. So um, those would be my recommendations. Yeah, and I would add on The Dispossessed to that list of yes. Yes. Solar books to check out for sure. So. Gordon, I think everybody knows where to find you, runesoup.com, uh, blog and podcast is everywhere. Uh, Jay, tell people where they can find you and your work if they're interested. Yep, you can follow me on Twitter. It's at the Um and you can also find me at thejmo.net. Awesome. Well, guys, hey, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to spend with me and uh, chat about this topic. It's been 
something I've just been getting into myself. So uh, you guys have been a, a small inspiration here and, you know, just little changes in my life too. So I appreciate you taking the time, especially Jay, while you're traveling and Gordon, uh, just all your personal situations considered. So thanks so much, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you and welcome aboard, Ryan. And there you have it. My thanks again to Gordon White and Jay Springett. As I said, very cool and kind of them to make some time for the chat here, all circumstances considered. And thank you guys for making time for this chat as well. These are the types of conversations I enjoy the most. You know, uh, tracing these, these ideological movements throughout history. But this isn't a historical ideological movement. It's happening right now as I speak. Add in the fiction component to it, which I absolutely get down with, and the activist component, which I also get down with, and you have a recipe for revolution. I actually have been dabbling with a solar punk-ish idea for a fictional story. I have a few notes, I guess, nothing actually written yet. So maybe I'll make some time here to more fully develop that. And hey, maybe I can contribute in some small way to this movement, which, as far as I can tell, it's pretty damn practical and easy to implement in your life, no matter where you stay. Guerrilla gardening, as Jay said, plant your own progress. And that's what I love about this. It's all about individuality and personal agency, creating a better future for us right now and for generations to come. And it reintroduces ideas and practices back into the popular discourse. You know, things we should have learned as children. It promotes scientific and ecological and environmental literacy, which the average person has little of. It's cleaner, it's healthier, it's more sustainable, and it's just flat out fucking better. I'd love to hear someone argue against it. Anyway, a shout out to new patron Phil and returning patron Julie. Thank you, and welcome back. You can help support the show as well if you feel so inclined by logging onto patreon.com slash oldculture. And if I find some time here, I think I may revamp the Patreon. Uh, but who knows? Finding time these days is literally looking for needles in haystacks. So we will see. Uh, but speaking of time, I'm out of it for now. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.